Okay, good afternoon. And uh, my, my son, some of you may know this, uh, my son is a um, board certified internist, works at Kaiser Permanente up in the Northwest. We actually spent last week together, he helped me run a uh, 70 person Whole Foods supermarket immersion program, which we actually finished yesterday. And uh, one of the, he and I have been dealing with a lot of things over the years, uh, him becoming a doctor, living in my shadow, so to speak. And one of the things that we talked about a couple of months ago, he's trying to help people. He's, he's probably taken care of up at Kaiser Permanente in the Northwest. He's probably taken care of about 350 people and seen phenomenal results like this. But it's hard, you know, it's hard to get people to change and a couple of months ago, he came to me and he said, you know, Dad, he said, they just don't care. People just don't care. And I said, excuse me, son, it, they just don't know. That's the problem, is, is, is people just don't know why they're sick and they don't know how to get well. I mean, well, can you imagine two young people living life with those kind of blemishes? Or, or as I see it, I watch men, we could just stand out here, you and I could go out in the lobby here at the Hyatt Hotel, and we could watch men walk by and glance at their profile and they'd look like they're seven months pregnant. They do, they look like they're seven months pregnant. They care, they just don't know any better. Or many women uh, have to go to the big girls' sizes at the dress shop. I think they care, they just don't know. And for families to lose uh, you know, a father or a husband from a heart attack, it's just that they don't know, they really do care. <clears throat> I've, been, uh, I've been at this since, well, let's see, 1968. I started in medical school in 1972. Mary and I got married, moved to Hawaii, started taking care of people. So 1972, <clears throat> how many years is that? That's like, what, 42 years. 42 years, and, and, and I've taken care of thousands of people, not just a few hundred, and I know people care. Not everybody cares, and it's not easy to find the people that care and want to change, but when you do it, it's absolutely amazing how you change their lives, and you make that difference. And once people see it, you know, as I'm sure almost everybody in this audience does, once you see it, you, you just can't believe that everybody doesn't see it and everybody doesn't respond and everybody doesn't take action. And I think it's just because they haven't seen it. It's not because they don't care. We have to go out and tell everybody. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit about how I've come to tell the story. I used to tell the story in terms of scientific literature. In fact, <clears throat> you know, some of you have read my books. I've written 12 national best-selling books, heavily referenced with the scientific literature. Thank you. Well, yesterday, yesterday my son, my son went home, but before he went home, I drug him down in the basement where the archives are, where all the research papers that I gathered, I collect, and are sitting in these, uh, these big file cabinets downstairs. And he asked me something because he was seeing patients. We had 70 Whole Foods people last week. And what he saw is occasionally somebody's cholesterol went up. I said, well, son, that's because, that's because when they lost a lot of weight, these were people that lost like 10 pounds in six days. I said, it's when they lose weight, the cholesterol and uric acid and so on comes out of their body fat and goes into the bloodstream. He says, well, I've never heard of that, Dad. And I said, well, come on downstairs, I'll show you. And I took him downstairs and we looked under cholesterol and fasting and I pulled out the paper and I said, here's the scientific paper. He says, you know, this is from 1972. He said, Dad, how'd you ever find that paper? I said, well, you didn't have computers back then, did you? And I said, no. I said, what we used to do, son, is we would take, we'd read one scientific paper, and we'd look at the references in that paper, and then we'd go and look up other scientific. We didn't have a computer. He was amazed. And then he said, son, he says, Dad, did you read all those papers? I said, son, look at all those underlines. Who do you think put them there? <laughs> well, I used to try and convince people to take good care of themselves by showing them the facts. You know, show them that the scientific literature uh, tells the story very clearly, and that works with some people. As time has gone on, I found different ways to tell the story, and I'd like to tell you how I tell the story now. This is about all I talk about. Sometimes I find myself in the shower, just uh, washing myself off, thinking, oh, 
Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning and how to cure it by eating beans, corn, rice, and potatoes. It just, just kind of goes over in my mind because that's all I think about these days is Dr. McDougall's color picture book. When I talked to you last time when I was here, I was, all I was talking about was the starch solution because that's the book I had just written. Who knows what I'm going to be talking about next time. But this is all I have on my mind these days is Dr. McDougall's color picture book. And let me tell you how this came about. I wrote these 12 national best-selling books and only a few people read them. And my agent came to me in May of this year and she said, John, we'd like you to write another book. Rodale made a lot of money on the starch solution and Penguin Putnam, we used to be in the five, top 5% 5 of book sales for Penguin Putnam. And so they made a lot of money and my agent, of course, my literary agent, she makes a lot of money every time we sell. That's the only way she makes money is when her author sells books. So she came to Mary and I in May and she said, look, I can get you this much money if you'll write another book. It was a lot of money. But I said, I'm not going to write any more word books. I'm done writing word books. I've written all the word books that anybody ought to write in their whole lifetime. I'm done writing word books. But I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll write a color picture book for you. So far, she's not been interested. But I went to in June. Anybody go with us in June to Costa Rica? OK. Oh, you, Larry and Ann were there. Well, that's all I was thinking about was the color picture book in June when we had 140 people with us in Costa Rica. And uh, they helped me. You know, the, the people who were on the trip, they helped me put this color picture book together. And so <clears throat> in my trip in June of uh, 2014 to Costa Rica, I put together a 66-page color picture book. And I put it up on my website for free. So far, no literary agent has bought it. Maybe nobody ever will. But it's free for you. It's not only free for you in English, it's in Dutch and Chinese, and it's just about to be put up in Japanese, and it's on all kinds of languages. It's a color picture book that explains the story in very simple terms. And what I'd like to do is share with you Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning, on food poisoning and how to cure it by eating beans, corn, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and rice. <clears throat> However, before I put this color picture book out, I wanted to test it to make sure that it worked. What I did is I sat down with my six, eight, and 10-year-old grandsons who live right near us. They're Heather's children, live right near us. And I sat down with them and I went through the 66 pictures in the color picture book and I asked them, do you understand this? And they said, yes, Grandpa, we understand. So I figured if they understood it, Everybody could understand it. And what I did is I used the universal signs for go and stop and caution. And that helped them understand what I was talking about in terms of what they're supposed to do. So if you'd like to read Dr. McDougall's, this is all, I'm not writing any more word books. If you'd like to read Dr. McDougall's color picture book on food poisoning and how to cure it, you just go to my website, it's there. And as I say, it's probably in 15 languages now and hopefully we get it in 30, 40, 50, 60 languages so people can understand. Food poisoning. You must, I think, I think these days, that's all I look at it as, is you must look at this as food poisoning. And when you do, when you look at it as food poisoning, it all makes sense you know exactly what to do. Like, for example, say, what was the, the book Endurance? Anybody read the book Endurance? About uh, Shackleton's trip to the Antarctic? I just finished it, good book. The, the, the men, they were suffering from lead poisoning. You remember that? In the book, the, the, the men were eating, uh, what was it, tomatoes out of lead cans. And they were suffering from lead poisoning. These are the explorers to the Antarctic back 100 years ago. And their ship, the Endurance, it sunk in the Antarctic. And all they had was can supplies. And, and the cans were made of lead. And pretty soon, they started losing their hair and their fingernails. And they were suffering from lead poisoning, food poisoning. And guess what? As soon as the doctor, remember the doctor on there, as soon as the doctor discovered what it was, he stopped the men from eating the tomatoes, which were in cans that were made of lead. And guess what happened? In a couple of weeks, the lead poisoning was cured. Same thing with methylmercury, when people are suffering from methylmercury poisoning. When you stop the food poisoning, they're cured. Or say you had a uh, chronic uh, staphylococci or salmonella or listeria poisoning that was going on. You were poisoning yourself with these microbes all the time. The way you would cure it was you would stop the food poisoning, yes? All right. Well, what people are suffering from, and maybe, hopefully, when I get done with this presentation, you'll look at it from the same point of view that I do. What people are suffering from in our society is food poisoning. 
it's food poisoning of such a, uh, a grandiose level, it far exceeds any lead poisoning, tobacco poisoning, heroin poisoning, alcohol, uh, cocaine poisoning, alcohol poisoning, all the poisonings you can imagine in your family, in your personal life, in your community, in your country, in your world, all the poisonings you can imagine put together are insignificant compared to the food poisoning that's going on. Now, in terms of the toll that it takes on you personally, your family, your community, your nation, and planet Earth. Food poisoning. Food poisoning, and, and the way you cure food poisoning, you stop the food poisoning, but you have to recognize it first as food poisoning. Otherwise, you're kind of helpless. This is food poisoning. Two-thirds of people, according to current statistics, suffer from food poisoning in this form. They're overweight or obese. And of course, being overweight and obese, that's associated with more heart disease, more breast cancer, more colon cancer, more prostate cancer. More, that's how you get type 2 diabetes. So food poisoning results in being overweight and obesity and the secondary manifestations that you see so commonly in our society. This is one result of food poisoning. This is food poisoning. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes is due to food poisoning. And if you stop the food poisoning, people with type 2 diabetes are cured, and people with type 2, 1 diabetes are greatly benefited. They're not cured. Food poisoning. 135 million people every, every year in the United States suffer from this form of food poisoning in terms of a heart attack. It's food poisoning. Food poisoning. In my May 2014 newsletter, I published an article that I wouldn't have published in the past. If I would have written this story uh, that I wrote in my May 2014 newsletter, if I had written it 20 or 30 years ago, my colleagues would have likely come after me, labeled me a quack, told me that I was, uh, I was uh, delusional, I was uh, misleading patients, I was keeping them from good standard arthritic care by telling them that lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, and psoriatic arthritis are a consequence of food poisoning from the rich Western diet. And if you stop it, as I reported in my May 2014 newsletter, I showed you 10 cases of debilitating, deadly, inflammatory arthritis, people with rheumatoid and psoriatic arthritis who just stopped the food poisoning and were cured. 10 cases published it, didn't get a single comment from a single rheumatologist, from a single member of any medical society, any place, because of this day and age, folks, medical and non-medical, recognize food poisoning, know it to be true, and realize we have to do something about it. So, this is food poisoning. Food poisoning, breast, colon, and prostate cancer are due to food poisoning. Everybody knows about the purple pill. Why does everybody know about GERD and indigestion and Nexium and the purple pill? It's because we have massive food poisoning out there. You can go into uh, pharmacies all over the world and you can see these pills for sale all over the Western world. Why? Because people are suffering from food poisoning. Food poisoning. This is food poisoning. Okay, so now you recognize, as a matter of fact, if you stop and think about it, and if you even, if you, there's even any hint in your mind that what I say is true, what you're thinking right now is, every place I look, I see food poisoning. All through my family, through my school, through my business, every place I look, people are suffering from food poisoning. Well, they are. And the only way you're going to fix it is to stop the food poisoning. Just like Shackleton and his men did with lead poisoning 100 years ago, they stopped eating out of the lead cans, and the body healed, and the food poisoning went away. Food poisoning has been recognized for thousands of years. You can go back uh, 3,500 years ago, 4,000 years ago, look at the priests, priestess, pharaohs, kings, queens of the Middle East of Egypt, the mummies, you look at the mummified uh, remains of these aristocrats from 3,500, 4,000 years ago, and you see that they suffered from food poisoning. Just a recent report of 44 uh, autopsies, so to speak, done with CAT scans where they looked at the arteries of priests, priestess, kings, queens, pharaohs, 
and they found out of the 44 that they examined, 20 had extensive atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries in the heart, the kidneys, the aorta, the legs, and so on. They suffered from food poisoning 3,500, 4,000 years ago. And the aristocrats of three, four, five hundred years ago, the kings and queens of the past who were fat, had the gout, had diabetes, they suffered from food poisoning. Just back then, three, four thousand years ago, or four, five hundred years ago, there were only a few people who were wealthy enough to poison themselves with rich food. The difference is, is today, we have a society, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, modern technology, and fossil fuels, we have a society where everybody in Western society can afford to and does poison themselves with rich foods. Burger King, Dairy Queen, Imperial Margarine. That's why people are sick from food poisoning due to the rich Western diet. All right, so how do you fix food poisoning? This is a, a, a revelation that I've had to come through to after 40 years. I used to be a nice guy. I'm not a nice guy anymore. I used to tell people they have to do better. They have to be sensible. They have to be reasonable. They have to cut down. Nobody ever got better. I mean, I know you, most of you know that I never really did that. I was always pretty tough. But <laughs> I kind of I kinda was nicer in the past. And it's over the last four decades of trying to help people get better that I have uh, been able to speak more clearly about what you must do. If you recognize food poisoning, just like the Nelson twins, and Willie, their brother, and Sabrina, and some of you, if you recognize that you're suffering from food poisoning that's causing acne, chest pain, breast lumps, constipation, indigestion, if you recognize that in yourself or your friends or relatives, what you must do is you must stop the food poisoning. Plain and simple, you can't cut down. Why can you not cut down? The, the Nelson twins tried, they couldn't do it, they just told you. They had to recognize the problem and do it 100%. The reason is, it's not because 100% really is required, you could do 99.99%. If you could, but you can't. I know you can't. That's what I've come to the conclusion uh, about over all these many years, is people can't cut down. They can't be reasonable, they can't be sensible, they can't be prudent. They have to deal with food poisoning the same way that some of us have had to do, deal with tobacco poisoning, and some of us have had to deal with alcohol poisoning, and some of us have had to deal with cocaine and heroin and other kinds of poisonings. What we had to do is we had to, to change our behavior is we had to stop at 100%. Believe me, I quit smoking October 20th, 1972 at 7 a.m. in the morning. The only reason I am smoke free now is because every day I get up and say, I will not smoke another cigarette. You know who I'm talking about. There are very few of you who can be moderate and smoke two cigarettes a day or have a glass of wine three or four times a week if you are the kind of personality that I am and you probably recognize. Same thing with food. If you want to get over the obesity, overweight, constipation, indigestion, et cetera, you want to change your future, you have to do what Nancy Reagan told us to do. Remember what Nancy Reagan said to the drug addicts? Yeah, that's what you have to do. There's nothing in between. You just have to say no. You have to stop doing it. All right, food poison. This is food poison. You might not recognize it as food poison, but it is. Start thinking of it in those terms. It is food poison for human beings. I have one pet left. I used to have three parrots, some dogs, and several cats, and a snake here and there. I've only got one cat left, that's it. To the cat, this is food. That cat would take this particular food source, defeather it, tear it open, and eat it because that's the cat's food. This is not your food. When you try and eat this food, like the cat does well with, you get sick. This is food poison. This is food poison. Oil is food poison. You must recognize it as that. There's just two large categories of food that you have to just say no to, and those are animal foods and oils. 
This is hard for people to think oil, like olive oil, is toxic. Everybody's told me it's good for me. Flaxseed oil is good for me. Fish oil is good for me. No, it's not. It's giving you acne and obesity, greasy skin, promotes cancer. We've known that since the 1920s. These vegetable oils are very strong promoters of cancer, heart disease, all kinds of problems. And you must stop that behavior. When you eat oil, let me just ask you, stop and think about it for a minute. When you eat, say for example, you took a couple tablespoons of oil, or maybe a whole bowl full of oil like this, and you ate it, where do you think that oil goes? Do you think it evaporates out of your ears? Do you think it just kind of disappears someplace? No, when you eat that fat, you wear it on your skin and under your skin and it causes food poisoning. When I tell you you can't eat animal foods, some of you, most of you here, I know you already came here as believers and you already understand this message. When I give you this message, you, you don't, it doesn't bother you at all. You've already thought through it. But some of you, you were dragged here against your will, but you ended up here. And now you have somebody standing on stage, not just myself, but the other presenters. They stand on stage and they tell you a message that you've heard over and over again. And that is that you're not supposed to eat meat and butter and eggs. You've heard this before. Or cheese. And you're thinking, what am I going to do? There's nothing to eat. It's like, it's like somebody telling you that you're not supposed to breathe air anymore. You say, I will die or drink water anymore. You're not supposed to drink dirty water. You're not supposed to bring, breathe dirty air. But you can, you can breathe clean air and you can eat and you can drink clean water and you can eat clean food. So me just telling you you can't eat animal foods, you can't eat oils, it leaves some of you with this huge vacuum and you say, I will never survive until I tell you what you're supposed to eat. Here's what you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to eat starch. You are a starchivore, you are a starchitarian, you are a starch eater. Until you figure that out, you're lost. You're totally out of control, you're hungry, you can't understand why every time you eat you gain weight, why every time you eat your stomach hurts, you can't understand why you don't have energy. You just can't understand why the picture doesn't come together for you until you understand that you're a starch eater. Starches are parts of plants that store a large amount of energy for the plant. Where starch comes from is uh, plants, they take carbon dioxide from the air, they take water from the ground, they take sunshine as energy, they use that energy to convert carbon dioxide and water into sugar called glucose. Plants make that glucose for their own needs so that they can run their body parts, their leaves and their stems and so on. That's why they make the glucose for their own energy. And then what a plant does is it takes some of that energy and it stores it for use later on. And that use later on would be when the plant becomes a new. So a plant, it's growing in the summer and the fall and then winter comes and the plant dies and then the next season the plant has to become a new. Well to become a new it needs genetic material but it also needs energy to sprout or to germinate. So the plant during its growing season it makes the sugar glucose and it takes these sugars and stores them in long chains and then it takes these long chains of sugar known as starch. You call them complex carbohydrate, but that's way too confusing for me. It's called starch. You take, they, the plants take the starch and they store it in their plant parts so they have energy for the new plant when the spring comes. They store it underground in plant parts, like for example in tubers or roots or corms. These are underground storage organs. The plant stores it underground and then when the new season comes, the potato sprouts into a new plant from that stored energy. Or the plant can store that energy above ground in the form of seeds called grains and legumes. These are high sugar seeds. Beans, peas, lentils, wheat, corn, and so on. And the plant stores the energy above ground in these seeds so that when the new season comes and the genetic material lands in the ground, it has energy to become a new corn plant, or pea plant, or bean plant. That stored energy is called starch. 
And what you do uniquely as a human being, and I mean uniquely as a human being, is you tap into this stored energy. Human beings are star cheaters. Always have been, always will be. And it's the way you solve food poisoning is you substitute fat, which is from animal foods or vegetable oils, you substitute that energy source for sugar, which is the starch in plants. So that's, your, that's the way you solve poof poison is you eat starch, and along with that starch, you can have some non-starchy, greeny yellow vegetables, but not much. Just a little, I know some of you have tried to have a lot. You've tried to be nutritarians. You've tried to live on kale and broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage. And you say, something's wrong. I'm starving to death. Well, of course you are. That's not your food. Nobody's ever lived on a cabbage or kale diet. Never happened, never will happen. Just not enough energy. Now you can have some of this kale, some of these sprouts, you know, a little lettuce, a little celery. You can have some of that as a side dish. For those of you who are trying to be vegetarians or vegans living on these non-starchy, green yellow vegetables, give it up. It's not gonna work. You're not gonna feel well. Your stomach will be growling. You're gonna be hungry all the time. Why? Because you have not tapped into a high energy source, which is known as starch. You need that energy. You have to chase the two-year-old around. You have to make it to work. You have to maybe do some physical activity or just breathe. You need the energy to just breathe. And you have to get that energy from starch. You can add some green and yellow vegetables as a side dish. Maybe 5%, maybe 10%. If you want to push it, maybe 30% by eyeball. And you can have a little bit of fruit too. A little fruit, but not a lot. Maybe one fruit, maybe three fruits. I have a nectarine tree outside of my house. And every uh, late August, that nectarine tree comes in bloom, and I get about three or four grocery bags of nectarines. Unbelievably tasty. And I'll eat one grocery bag myself. Thank goodness that nectarine tree is only in bloom for about five days a year. I would be tempted. But it's not. Fruits are not in bloom all year long, unless, of course, you have Whole Foods or Safeway. But otherwise, they're not in bloom. They're only in bloom a short, a short time of the year. Uh, these are foods that may get you ready for the fall, give you a little extra energy. They're certainly tasty. They're a nice reward. They're simple sugars. They satisfy, but not very long. You're hungry quite quickly after eating fruit. That's why I have known very few fruitarians in my entire career. Steve Jobs tried for a while, not long. A few other friends that you know have tried to be fruitarians. Occasionally they can do it with some effort, but no population has ever lived on a fruit-based diet, not that I know of. So your diet, when you decide to give up food poisoning, is a diet of starches, starches. Yes, starch is the center of your meal plan with some fruits and vegetables. Once you stop the food poisoning, what happens is the body spontaneously cures. This is the miracle. This is why, and I appreciate many of you coming up telling me how much I helped you, and even some of you said I cured you. I didn't cure you. I just gave you a little information so you stopped the food poisoning. And your body naturally cured itself. The body has this innate ability to cure itself, to heal itself. You go out and get in a horrible auto accident. You break three or four or five bones, slice your skin all to pieces. What do you think happens? As long as you don't get another car accident, is your body heals. Because it does that, it just naturally heals. It's one of the, uh, the inner powers of the body. You just have to let it happen. And the way you let it happen, the body's always healing. You think your body stopped healing. I know some of you have heart disease, atherosclerosis, diabetes, constipation. Some of you even have cancer. And you and your doctors have kind of given up on you and said, well, you're done. Your body stopped. Your body hasn't stopped. Your body is continually trying to survive. That's what it does. Without exception, it always does. But most often it can't because the injury outpaces the body's ability to heal. Let me give you one example before I move on, just to show you how you cure people. Cure people. Give people an opportunity to cure themselves. Is you just stop the repeated injury. Say I had a nervous habit, 
And that nervous habit was every day I took a couple tablespoons of hydrochloric acid and threw it on my hand. I would get a sore on my hand. I would get uh, uh, ulcers and inflammation and maybe some pustules forming there. And uh, what would happen at the same time that, that that injury occurred from the hydrochloric acid is the body would be, uh, would be, uh, it would be, become inflamed. It would swell, it would get red. Fluids would come in there. And uh, what would happen is, uh, is scar tissue would eventually settle in as the body was healing itself. But unfortunately, what's happening now is I have this nervous habit and I keep throwing acid every day or two on my hand. So even though my hand is trying to heal, and it is, even to the point of forming scar tissue, the injury outstrips the body's ability to heal. Now just say one day what I decide to do I got these horrible sores all over my hand. What I decided to do is I stopped, decided to th stop throwing hydrochloric acid on my hand. Now, what do you think is going to happen? Three or four days, you start seeing the healing outstrip the injury. A week or so later, there aren't any new sores. Uh, a week or two after that, what you find is you've got a little scar tissue left, and it's done. It's the body healed. So the way you cure food poisoning, all the things that I mentioned to you, is you just stop the poison. Let me, uh, here's an example. I, I, I tried to show this in Mumbai, India. It didn't go over well. But uh, it's one that a lot of people can relate to here. Here's an example of how people knew about food poisoning 2,500 years ago. Here's a story about Daniel and his men who uh, were vegetarians. And they talked to the gatekeeper in the king's castle. And what Daniel asked the gatekeepers whether or not they could do a comparative experiment, the first controlled trial that I'm aware of. And so what Daniel did is he took his men who were vegan vegetarian and he compared them for 10 days with the men who ate the royal food. And you could see published in the Bible in the first chapter of Daniel the results of that controlled trial. What they found 2,500 years ago is the men who ate the pulses and water were in excellent health compared to the men who ate the rich food. I could have told this story by t bringing quotes from the Bhagavad Gita or the Koran or other historical and religious stories. People have observed this for thousands of years. When folks eat rich food, in other words, meat and oil and other junk, and give up the starches, vegetables, and fruits, they get fat and sick. Yeah, okay. Now, some of you are thinking about changing your diet. You need to know also that the diet that I'm talking about is the diet that winners eat. Since 1968, the long-distance endurance competitions for the Olympics have been dominated by two groups of people. Since 1968, they've come in within the first four places in the Olympics. And those people are from Kenya and Ethiopia. And people wonder, how can they run so long with such endurance? It's because they live on corn and other starches. Or I love this story. Because some of your, your friends and relatives, when you tell them you're going to give up meat, they're going to wonder where you get your strength. This is a story of gladiators. Gladiators are known as the barley men. Gladiators, they won their competitions in the Colosseum in large part because of the way they ate. Gladiators ate barley and beans. Why did they eat barley and beans? Because you didn't get to come back twice if you weren't really good. You were done. The most competitive of all people throughout history, particularly in long endurance and endurance events, have been starch eaters. Uh, let's see, how fast did the healing occur? I just ran a program we finished yesterday with 70 people from Whole Foods Market. We had, uh, oh, about a dozen diabetics, people with high blood pressure, overweight, et cetera. Immediately, as soon as they come in, and, and the week before that, we ran a program with 50 people who were just independent people who come to our program, and they had diabetes and heart disease and kidney disease and so on. Immediately what happens when people stop the food poisoning is the bowels get better. The constipation goes away, the indigestion goes away, the oiliness of the skin changes. I was listening to the Nelson twins talk about their, their issue. Well, let's see, today's Sunday. It was on, it was uh, Friday morning. I'm sitting down 
at the table with one of the, the whole group of 70 participants from Whole Foods Market, and there was a young woman, a little older than the Nelson twins, a young woman who was sitting there with partially healed scars all over her face. And she's telling me, and I could just see it, I could just see it in her, in her emotion, how she felt about it. She says, I tried everything. I went to the dermatologist. Uh, they were going to put me on Accutane. I went on a vegetarian diet. I did everything I could. And she says, I want you to know. I just want you to look at my face. She's telling me Friday. Well, look at my face. She says, it's all dry and the, all the sores are healing, just like you just saw here. That happens within about 24 hours. Of course, when you eat the unhealthy food, you get back into the food poisoning, the greasiness of the skin comes back in a matter of hours, the indigestion comes back. They have, there's something called McDougal's revenge that occurs quite quickly, <laughs> immediately. And then within about four months, most of the problems you have from food poisoning that are able to be healed are healed within about four months. People with horrible inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis, pretty much healed in about four months. You're not gonna lose 80 pounds in four months. It takes a little longer than that. People lose weight at about eight to, eight to 10 to 12 pounds a month. But otherwise, most of the reversal that you're gonna see in terms of chronic illness takes place in about four months. Do be realistic though, there is uh, scar tissue left behind, just like with cigarette smoking. If you've ever known anybody who smoked cigarettes, seriously, like I used to, they have a problem with terrible cough and wheezing. As soon as they stop smoking cigarettes, what happens? They get better. It happens within a matter of hours, if not, if not just a couple of days. The same thing happens with the food poisoning. As soon as you stop it, the body starts get, to get better. With that long-term smoking that many of you have done, there are scars left in the lungs. Just like with the artery disease that you cause from shoveling bacon and eggs into your artery walls, there are scars left. There is residual left, but you would be amazed at how much of it is reversed. We were on a uh, presidential program in Santa Rosa, California. This is a picture of the resort. There we serve people unlimited amounts of starch-based foods. And I tell people, I think on average the 70 people lost about four pounds in six days. Our average weight loss, I'll show you the figures in just a second. What we do is we just, all we do is we just, we don't stop the alcohol, we don't stop the coffee, we don't stop the other drug addictions people have, we don't, we don't exercise them much, we don't ask them to think good thoughts, we don't have them meditate. All we do is stop the food poisoning and we get these amazing results at our uh, seven day program, or excuse, 10 day program. It's actually seven day intervals that we're measuring. We published these results about 15 years ago the first time, and we're about to publish them again. Here are the weight losses in 1,615 people. These are the women, about 1,000 women that we gathered the data on over the last 10 years. And the average weight loss is about three pounds. It is much, so. do you know that the average weight gain on a seven day cruise is eight to 12 pounds, depending on the study you look at. With the same kind of free for all eating, unrestricted eating, ad libitum eating that we have at our clinic, feeding people foods they very much enjoy, the average weight loss for women is about three pounds for men, it's a little bit more. This data, by the way, was just accepted two weeks ago for publication in the journal Nutrition. So you will, you will see these, uh, this data coming out probably within the next two or three months. Um, it wasn't easy to get it accepted, let me tell you. But we finally got it accepted by the Journal of Nutrition. Here's the uh, weight loss in men. You, you notice the more people weigh when they start out, the more they lose. We had a couple of people who lost uh, 10 pounds, a couple of people who lost 12 pounds. Of course, with those people who lost 10 or 12 pounds, there were a couple of people who didn't lose at all. But on average, that's what you get. On average, in terms of cholesterol drop, we get a 22-point drop in cholesterol. No changes in medication. A 22-point drop in cholesterol in seven days. That's the interval that we measure it. And that's as good as you can get with Lipitor, or probably better. And the sicker people are, the higher the cholesterols were when they started out, the greater the drop. For example, people who start with cholesterols in the 250, 280 range, they get about a 44-point drop in cholesterol compared to those, say, in the 200 range, which get about a 23-point drop in cholesterol. Uh, we take uh, most people off blood pressure pills, and we get it on an average an eight over four millimeter drop in blood pressure, stopping all their blood pressure medications in almost every case. 1,615 people we analyzed, and people with really high blood pressure, they'll get 
sometimes pretty profound drops in blood pressure, like 20 over 15 millimeters of mercury drop blood pressure, and they'll stop their medications. Now, those are short-term results, and you're sitting there thinking, well, short-term, that's seven days. Yes, you have 1,615 people that you're published in the scientific journals, and you publish the results of 500 people about 15 years ago, but that's only seven days. How can you brag about seven days? Well, we have some longer-term data that uh, was presented twice at two medical meetings this year. It was uh, presented at a meeting in Philadelphia and then one in Boston last week. It was published by, it was presented by Oregon Health and Science University, which is the medical school in Portland. They did a long-term study of our patients. These were patients with a special need. They were people with multiple sclerosis. And what we started in 2008, and actually the study began in 2009, we kind of put our minds together in 2008. In 2009, we started the study, and in 2013, we finished it. What we did was a randomized, raider-blinded, in other words, single-blinded study on the effect of our diet, taking care of people, our clinic, on patients with multiple sclerosis. Now these are younger people. On average, our patient population is about 55 years of age. These people were on average of about 30 years of age. You can see the data. If you want to see the data, it's in my July 2014 newsletter. I'll give you the exact figures. But they were younger people. <clears throat> they didn't come for weight loss. They came for multiple sclerosis. And they were randomized. In other words, we took these 60 people. It's a study that our foundation paid for. But OHSU did it. They collected all the data. They did all the analysis, completely independent of us. Believe me, this is an unbiased study. They had no intention on showing good results from our program. They were just there to show the results. So they took uh, these 60 people, and then basically they flipped a coin, and they said, you're going to stay on the control diet which is the typical American diet, or you're going to go on the McDougal diet. You're going to get trained at their clinic in Santa Rosa, California. The, uh, first of all, I want you to know it took almost a year to get the study approved by the Ethics Board. That's right. The, uh, the, uh, the review board that makes sure it's ethical to do an experiment called the IRB, the Ethics Board at Oregon Health and Science University, took one year and multiple communications to figure out it was safe to feed people potatoes and rice. This same board will approve drugs that cost $50,000 a year and kill people and have essentially no effect that you'd want to buy on multiple sclerosis. They'll approve that kind of study in a couple hours. It took us a year. Finally, after a year, they said, OK, it's safe to feed this diet to people with multiple sclerosis. And then the next thing they said to us, rightly so, is that, OK, you can try, but nobody's going to follow this diet. And of course, my response is, yes, they will, because we're going to train them. We're going to have them go through our clinic. We're going to teach them all the things that we think are necessary for people to make changes. And we're going to have them do it. They said, all right, give it a try. So independently, they analyzed what happened to our patients. They looked at the control group, which is in red. That's the fat intake of the control group, which was 40% fat. And they maintained that 40% fat intake for the entire year. The intervention group, the ones who were taught properly, and you can do the same thing any place, Los Angeles, Memphis, <laughs> you know, Miami, Florida, wherever you want. You can, you can do the same kind of education. We have to do it in Santa Rosa, nothing special. We just seriously taught these people how to eat well. We showed them what the foods were like. We explained to them clearly what uh, supports good health and what doesn't. We didn't give them any moderation sensibility. We just taught them exactly what to do, and they did. The results were, surprised everybody, and should surprise you, but this is what they found. The results are that the intervention group dropped their fat intake to 15% and maintained that fat intake for a year. In other words, they permanently changed their diet. When you looked at people who changed 100%, they found over 80% of the people who went through the intervention changed their diet 100% and maintained that change for a year. In other words, we permanently changed their diet in 80% of the people. And that's what the results show. In addition, 
We showed an average weight loss, if you included everybody, of about 10 pounds that they maintained for a year. 10 pound permanent weight loss. If you took out, there are three or four people who just plain and simple in the intervention group said, I'm not gonna have anything to do with this and they dropped out early. If you take those people out, what you find is the average weight loss was nearly 20 pounds. In other words, a permanent weight loss. These people didn't come for weight loss. They came for multiple sclerosis. Yet at the end of the year, the average weight loss was 20 pounds. Uh, cholesterol drops, here's the control group. They dropped their cholesterol, you see 186 to 180. They dropped their cholesterol six points. The intervention group, they came from multiple sclerosis, not heart disease, not high cholesterol. The intervention group, they dropped their cholesterol 19 points and maintained it for a year. Same thing with the bad cholesterol, triglycerides stayed about the same, et cetera. Those are the results that we got. Okay, so we have uh, we have uh, seven day results, seven to 10 day results, depending on which study you look at, on uh, approximately 2,000 people. We've got one year results from a randomized, rate or blinded, in other words, the person who was evaluating what was going on had no idea who changed their diet and who didn't. Properly done, it was as top of science as you could possibly put together because the reputations of the neurology department staff at Oregon Health and Science University depended upon doing the study correctly, and they did. So we've got one-year results showing that people permanently change their diet and get permanent benefits. Now, I've been at this for almost uh, 40 years, and I've had a chance to take care of many people, and I'm, I'm very very proud of the fact that we've made a positive difference in people's lives, just like many of you came up to me before the presentation and said, I know you're tired of hearing this, but I just want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I never get tired of hearing this. <laughs> I can't tell you how good it feels to be a physician, to be part of an organization that can impart information to people that they seriously consider and do, and it changes their life. So I've had a chance to look at, take care of many people over the years. I could show you, I, I could show you a hundred people. In fact, you can go to my website and look at success stories. And what you'll find are these results. This is what you should expect. If you watch Jenny Craig or Weight Watchers commercials, they'll tell you, this is the best case example. You shouldn't expect this. I'm here to tell you, this is what you should expect. This is what happens when you stop food poisoning. Here's a lady, this is actually six years ago, she changed her diet. I want you to notice, not only did she look, lose weight, but she looks younger and more attractive. This lady, this is kind of an interesting story, a newspaper reporter came to me about six months ago and said, I want a story of a morbidly obese person, Severe, severely obese. That means she had to have a BMI, or he had a BMI of more than 50%. And the person had to maintain successful weight loss for more than five years. And they came to me and they went to organizations all over the world looking for one single case of somebody with massive obesity who maintained their weight loss for more than five years. Well, this lady showed up. She's one of our patients. She had a BMI of 51% and this is her at 11 years. She's actually at about 15 years now. Permanent change permanently cured the problem, as essentially everybody does when they stop food poisoning. It's a guy from Hawaii who we've taken care of for, always been our patient for about eight years. Lady, 1991, so what's that, 23 years ago she changed her diet. Not just trimmer, but notice they look younger and more attractive. This lady wanted to go to Costa Rica with us for many years. She says, uh, I dreaded a family photo taken in January of 2007. It's been a long time since I liked any of my pictures. Now I can't pick one that I don't like. She, she finally went to Costa Rica with us. This a lady we took care of maybe 10 years ago. Not just lost weight, they look younger and more attractive. This guy I took care of, I've been taking care of him for 30 years. He weighed 450 pounds when I started taking care of him. He was on 25, med 25 different medications. Uh, anyway, we could go on like this for, for a long time. You've seen it. I know many of you these used to say, well, you could put my picture up here. Well, of course I could. It always happens. When you stop the food poisoning, people always get well. 
And that's the only way you can fix the problem is you have to identify the food poisoning and you have to stop it, just like with tobacco. You can't smoke two cigarettes a day. Just like with alcohol, you can't switch to beer and wine and cure alcoholism, it doesn't work. The same thing with food poisoning, you have to identify the poison and to replace it. This is food poison. We just had, uh, I told you, we had 70 people who left yesterday from Whole Foods Market employees. Whole Foods sent us, sends us, as they do to uh, three other immersion programs, sends patients every year to these programs. Why do they do it? Because Whole Foods Supermarket makes money doing this by having healthy employees. So on Thursday, they went to a Whole Foods Market. We take, we, we hit, take a, rent a bus. We took these 70 people to the Whole Foods Market. And I did something I don't always often do because many of them are meat cutters and you know, cheese salespeople and so on at Whole Foods. But I just happened to be in that mood on Thursday when they were going to Whole Foods Market. And I said to them, okay, now you're gonna go see Whole Foods Market. You've probably never looked at your market this way before. Go to the fruit and vegetable aisles and just kind of look around and smell and see how you feel about it. I said, then walk down the meat aisle and do the same thing. And tell me how you feel about it. If you haven't done it, if you're not there yet, you will be someday, you will be nauseated and sickened by the time you get to the end of the meat aisle. And that's what they told me. They said they never saw it that way, but that's exactly how they felt about it. They felt nauseated and sickened as they got to the end of the meal. For a very good reason. This isn't your food. This is food poison. My cat, Einstein, who I was telling you about a few minutes ago, if I took Einstein to Whole Foods or Safeway, I walked him down the meat aisle, he'd be over the counter, <laughs> after the butcher, and into this food because that's his food. Okay. Food poison. This is food poison. I don't know whether you find this attractive or not, but my guess is you don't. In fact, my guess is you couldn't eat this. We're not gonna do any tests. But my guess is you couldn't eat it. You'd ask me to cook it thoroughly and disguise the taste with barbecue sauce, steak sauce, ketchup, something you'd ask me to, sweeten sauce, something you'd ask me to put over this so that it would cover up the taste. I'll bet you would. Now Einstein, he just, just said fine with that, just like it is. In fact, I have to tell you, uh, every two or three day Einstein, he brings one of these to our back door, usually still with some feathers on it or he brings a little mouse or something, because that's his food. Uh, this is food poison. I know some of you don't recognize it as that, but I wish you would. In addition to it innately being food poison, because it's, the, it's, it's food that is really tough on your body, it's also full of methyl mercury. In fact, it's probably the only chance the fish have is they're so sickened with environmental contaminants that people should fear them. Food poison. Just take a look at this and see how you react to these foods. Not much to it, is it? Yellow and brown food. The only way I can, only way I can get people to eat this, and I, I talked to the folks who were in the cheese departments at Whole Foods, the only way you can get people to eat this is you have to load it with salt. I know this. When I was a resident back in my training 35 years ago, one of my jobs when I was on the kidney service is I'd have to get the kidney patients to eat saltless cheese and saltless butter. And I'd, after thorough instruction, I'd come back the next day and they'd look at me and they'd say, Doc, you've got to be kidding. That's just a glob of grease. You can't get it down unless you load it with salt and sugar. Food poison. This is food poison and I want you to recognize it. It may be a step better than the original muscle or secretion, but only a tiny step better. And these are the fake foods many of you are into. The fake meats, the fake burgers, the fake hot dogs, the fake cheeses, they're still food poison. You're not gonna get well by switching to these fake foods. Uh, this is food poison. Think about this. I can't say it too many times to you. Think about this. The fat goes someplace. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. Like the Nelson twins and Willie, all over their face, and they end up growing bacteria that make horrible acne. So it goes on the skin, and it goes under the skin. There is nothing especially attractive about wearing olive oil around your waist 
or in your buttocks or your thighs. It isn't any prettier than pig fat. Okay. One of the reasons that we're, we're still involved in this food poisoning, and it's so massive all over the world, this isn't just a problem in the United States. I told you I was in India seven weeks ago. Uh, the people in India are suffering from massive food poisoning, particularly the wealthy people. Type 2 diabetes, obesity, breast cancer, and so on. China. I haven't been to China, but I hear reports of China. What's happened there over the last 30 years? 30 years ago, fewer than 1% of the population in China had type 2 diabetes. Now, what they reported, they reported last year in the Journal of the American Medical Association, is 12% of the Chinese have diabetes and 50% are pre-diabetic. Yeah. This massive food poisoning continues because of marketing. And it's not a conspiracy. I just want you to know that this is business. The reason that this continues with your friends and relatives is because business is acting like business. And what business does is it tries to sell its products. And one of the ways that a business sells its products is it finds something special about its product and it markets it to death. In this case, your death. It's called, it's called unique positioning. Unique, they tell you something special about their particular car or computer or fax machine, or in this case, food. They take something special about it and they just advertise it to death. Like automobiles these days. The special thing about an automobile these days is the fact that it gets uh, 54 miles per gallon. You know, it's designed to be fuel efficient. And they are, but most of them are designed very flimsy, very lightweight, and if you get in an auto accident, you're much more likely to be killed in one of these light cars than in a more traditional heavy car. But that's not what they advertise is the fact that you and your family may be crushed to death. They advertise the fact that it gets 54 miles to gallon. You see, it's just business. And so it is with the food industry is they just take something unique about their product and they advertise it, whether or not it's true. They're not out there trying to hurt you. <coughs> this is not a conspiracy. They're just trying to sell product. For example, in the food industry, they have uh, taken one quality of their food, let me give you an example, protein, and they advertised it to the point where everybody believes that you must eat what to get protein? Meat. Meat. And the first thing your friends will say to you when, you when they find out you're vegetarian or vegan is where do you get your protein? I want to tell you, I have researched it thoroughly, I have stu I've studied the scientific literature that's been published over the last hundred years, I know it backwards and forwards. I want you to know that there is no such thing as dietary protein deficiency. You have never had a friend or a relative who has suffered dietary protein deficiency. Dietary protein deficiency has never been reported in any circumstance, experimental, historically, any place in the planet, never been reported on any diet that was sufficient in calories. It doesn't exist. There's no such thing as protein deficiency. Okay. Another, another position that a food company takes has to do with calcium. If I say calcium, you say? Milk, dairy, cheese. You must understand, you can research it yourself, you have one of those little, uh, you know, Blackberries or iPhones or computers, you can, you can do the research yourself. You will find out quickly that there has never been a report of dietary calcium deficiency ever on any diet that's been sufficient in calories. In other words, populations that live on rice, no dairy, you know, no calcium pill, never been reported. There's no such thing as dietary calcium deficiency. Yet that's the second thing that your friends will ask you when you tell them that you're on a vegan diet. Well, where do you get your calcium? Okay, now just one, one third example, the last example of unique positioning. If I say omega-3 fat, you say fish. Understand that no fish has ever made an omega-3 fat. N no animal can desaturate at the carbon-3 position to create an omega-3 fat. No cow, no pig, no sparrow, no fish, no lobster. They can't do it. Only plants can desaturate at the carbon-3 position. Only plants can make omega-3 fats. Yet everybody knows if you don't eat fish, you'll get omega-3 fatty acid deficiency. So here you have it. You have three warnings to you 
to not change your diet. If you do, you'll become protein deficient. You'll become calcium deficient. You'll become omega-3 fat deficient. You will, except that it's never happened. There is no such thing. It is not a conspiracy. Nobody's trying to hurt you. If it was a conspiracy, they would find this alignment where we'd uh, see farmers not having heart attacks. We'd see uh, butchers not having their wives get breast cancer. We would see, uh, we would see uh, pork farmers not having constipated kids. You see, they would take this, all this information about good eating and they would keep it to themselves and their family and they let all you get sick, all of us get sick. That's not what happens. These farmers, these marketers, they're, they're just as sick as everybody else. Everybody is li living under this delusion, this misinformation. And until you understand that a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables supplies all the calcium, all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the essential fats, all the everything you need, you're impaired in your ability to solve food poisoning. When you look around the world, and this is uh, the theme of the, the book that I wrote and published in 2011 called The Starch Solution, what you'll find is all large successful populations of people throughout all of verifiable human history have obtained the bulk of their calories from starch. As I told you, the Chinese before 1980, nobody was obese. Fewer than 1% of the population had type 2 diabetes. 90% of their diet came from rice. It's because they gave up the rice that they're fat and sick today. So you have the Asians living on rice, you have the Mayans and the Aztecs in Central America living on corn, you have the Incas in South America living on potatoes. Every time you turn on the news in the evening, you see stories about Egypt and Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan. That part of the world is known as the breadbasket of the world. These people for thousands of years lived on bread as people have in Western Europe. But all of a sudden, bread is evil. Starch makes you fat. How'd that happen? So the diet that has always been consumed, the diet you need to consume, is a diet based on starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables. That's the human diet. I wrote the book called The Starch Solution. It's the last word book I'm going to write. Instead, I've written this color picture book for you. Now, I, I could go back over those pictures I showed you of the beef and the chicken and the fish and the, and the butter and so on. Just remember the images that went through your mind. Those are the things you have to give up, the yellow and the brown food that tastes of grease, well, then it tastes of salt and sugar because they're high, trying to hide up the hide the disgusting or bland taste. What you have to do is you have to substitute those food poisons for these foods. See how you react to these pictures. This is how you solve food poisoning. We served these yesterday morning before the folks went home from their Whole Foods immersion program. They loved the pancakes. This even went over well in India. I, I tell people when they come to the program, either they come to the 10-day program or they come to the immersion program, the first night we serve pea soup, which is made of peas and, uh, and potatoes and carrots and various kinds of vegetables. And I tell them, I ask them, do they like the pea soup? And they say, oh yeah, we love the pea soup. And I tell them, you, you can go home after the program and you can live on pea soup and water for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for the next 18 years. You'll be in phenomenal health. You don't have to make a big deal out of this. You can make up a dish like this and eat it for breakfast, lunch, and dinner 14 times a day, seven days a week. Just live on these kinds of foods. They have everything you need in them. I'm sure you find this attractive. mashed potatoes. If it wasn't for mashed potatoes, I wouldn't be standing here right now. I, I was a very sick kid. I, I, I grew up in a family. My mother, she was from the Depression era. She had to live on, uh, on potatoes and rutabagas and, you know, really basic stuff during the Depression. They, they lived on the verge of starvation, my mother did, and my father. And as life got better, one of the promises they made to their children is they'd never have to suffer like they did. And we didn't. 
At seven, I was severely constipated and lost my tonsils. At, uh, as a teenager, I had the same kind of skin and acne problems the girls had. At 18, I had a massive stroke. At 24, I had major abdominal surgery. At 22, my mother called me fat. I'm 158 pounds now. I topped out at about 228. Yeah, but I didn't suffer like my mom did. No, I didn't. But she did make great mashed potatoes. This is my point. My mother would make for Bill, my brother, who, by the way, is a doctor who was down help, help, helping us last week with this whole food immersion program. <clears throat> she would make these great mashed potatoes with peas and corn. She put a brown gravy over the top. I know, the ground gravy wasn't made healthy then, but it is now. And it's still one of my favorite dishes. I could live on mashed potatoes and peas and corn and brown gravy three times a day. That's the meal we had Friday night as a graduation meal for the people at Whole Foods was uh, mashed potatoes and it was the main course. Uh, sweet potato, you can live on sweet potatoes and water. You can live on potatoes and water. You don't need anything else. Potatoes are known as the anti-scurvy vegetable. People have, by the millions, lived on potatoes and water alone. That's all they had. It supplied all the protein, all the vitamins, all the minerals, all the calcium. Everything they needed came from potatoes. In South America, millions of people, that's all they had. In uh, Poland and Russia, 114 years ago, that's all they had. Post-World War II Germany, that's all they had. Fortunately, that's all you need. All the nutrients you need, all the nutrients you require, you can get from sweet potatoes and water alone, or potatoes and water alone. Now you can't do that with seeds. You can't live on a grain like rice or rye or barley or wheat or legumes like beans, peas, and lentils and water alone. You can't do it. The reason is is because they're deficient in vitamin A and C. So to live on a diet of rice, you would have to add a uh, slice of orange a day or a floweret of broccoli a day to get your A and C. Otherwise, you could live on rice or barley or wheat or barley and beans like the gladiators did. You just have to have a little bit of fruit and vegetable to add the A and C. But if you don't want to go to that trouble, just eat potatoes and water. You'll be fine. <laughs> the staff of life, bread. Bread is an evil food. Well, excuse me, for 10,000 years, people have lived on bread as their primary source of calories. It's the staff of life. There's something wrong when it is one of the most feared foods ever. One of the foods I like best. How about this picture? Do you like this? Are you naturally attracted to this? Do you call this comfort food? Well, you do. Why do you like this? Because it's your food. That's what you're supposed to eat. That's why you react positively to this. I should have mixed this with some of the beef and chicken, but you remember. This is how you solve food poisoning. We prefer brown rice. If you come to our clinic, we only serve brown rice. You come to Hawaii with us in January. We're going to take 140 people to Hawaii. We do this once a year. And we take about 140 people to Costa Rica. We have not only brown rice, but we also have white rice. This is a vacation. White rice is not a deal breaker. Not preferred. You're better off with brown. But you'll do just fine. I mean, up until 1980, 2 billion Asians lived on white rice without a case of obesity. You could stand in a town square in Thailand or Vietnam or Cambodia. You could stand in a town square with 100,000 other people. There wouldn't be a single fat person on white rice. You'd be okay on white rice, preferably brown. That's how you cure food poisoning. These are not soy burgers, do note, they're grain burgers. All right, so you see all the green lights. My grandsons could clearly tell green, this is what you're supposed to eat. Red for the other ones, that's what you're not supposed to eat. And then uh, some fruits, you can have some fruits. You know, one, two, three, four fruits a day is plenty. You could eat more. A lot of simple sugar, not very satisfying for very long, very tasty. 
Do you need that starch as the center of your meal plan to last you through? To give you the long, the sustained energy, the endurance that you need, you gotta have that starch. Fruit isn't gonna quite do it. You can try, not gonna hurt you. And a few green and yellow vegetables. A few, not much. You've tried, didn't work. You need to be careful about uh, soy products. We do serve some soy products uh, on the first Friday night of the program. We uh, serve lasagna. And people think, well, that's fake cheese you put on the lasagna. No, it's not. It's a little tofu ricotta that Ma Mary makes. We use traditional soy products, like a little cooked soybean edamame. We will uh, serve a little bit of tofu, not a lot, just as a garnish. So you can have some tofu, some soybeans. They're a little high fat, a little high protein. I don't think they should be the center of your diet, but as a condiment, they're fine. Nuts and seeds, you can eat some nuts and seeds, unless you want to lose weight. If you live on nuts and seeds, you're gonna be what is known as a fat vegan. <laughs> Am I speaking to anybody here? <laughs> Probably not. Nuts and seeds are not unhealthy. They're just rich. They're 80 to 90% of the calories are fat. Nuts and seeds used to be a delicacy. When I was growing up in my family, we had mixed nuts once a year at Christmas. My dad would buy a five pound bag of mixed nuts. And that what us six McDougals did is we took this uh, steel players like contraption, a nutcracker, we cracked the nuts and we took a little pick and we dug them. It took us seven days, the six of us, to eat five pound bag. Today, nuts are a matter of just, they're gone. And as a result, there are a lot of well-intended people who are taking in a diet 70, 80, 90% fat by living on nuts and seeds. They're not unhealthy, they're just too rich. You're not gonna accomplish the weight loss you're looking for. So be careful with the nuts and seeds. You see the caution sign there? Okay, be careful. And avocados, 90% fat, be careful. They're okay, they're healthy, but they're fattening. And dried fruits, maybe something you wanna add. We often take care of people who are athletically inclined. They need extra calories. Dried fruits would be a good way to get any extra calories, but if you're trying to lose weight, then dried fruits should be kept to a minimum. Be careful. And uh, fruit juice, it's okay. I mean, the, the body's tough. It'll put up with fruit juice. Consider the body's put up with two packs of cigarettes, a half a bottle of whiskey, and hot dogs, and it's lived. It'll live on fruit juice, but not as well as it would on the fruit or the vegetable. You don't make a fruit and vegetable healthier by hitting it a thousand times with a steel blade. Don't kid yourself. <laughs> but what people are thinking is they're thinking this. Uh, if I take and pulverize my fruits and vegetables, I'll get more nutrients. You don't need more nutrients. You're not suffering from nutrient deficiency. There's not a person in here with scurvy or beriberi or pellagra or calcium or fat or any deficiency. The people, not necessarily in this room, but out in the lobby there as you walk out, these are people suffering from food poisoning from excess, you don't need more nutrients. If you want a few fruit drinks here and there, fine. Better to eat your fruits whole and vegetables whole. S spices and salt and sugar, we use salt, sugar, and spice. Many of you think of these as food poisonings. Yeah, but not like oil and not like animal foods. Those are the ones that are really sickening you and your family. If you have to focus on something to solve your problems, focus on the animal foods and the oils. The salt, the sugar, the spices, well, maybe not exactly health food, but then again, they might be. And they sure make the difference as to whether you're gonna eat the food or not. That's the main reason that we use a little salt, sugar, and spice in the food, is I want you to eat the food. I want you to like your starches. If I make them salt free, chances are you're not gonna like them. If I put a little bit of salt in the food, I bet you're gonna like it. People love salt. Naturally, you are designed as a salt seeker. Remember the tip of your tongue. It has taste buds which taste salt and sugar with pleasure. That wasn't a mistake. Nature did not make a mistake by designing us that way. We have sugar sensitive taste buds which cause us to go out and get sugar before in the form of rice and corn and sweet potatoes and potatoes and fruits and maybe a little honey, maybe a little maple syrup. 
course, now everything is loaded with sugar because industry knows how much we love sugar. You're designed as a sugar seeker. You should be eating sugar, preferably in its whole natural form. I can trick you into really liking the food if I put a little simple sugar on the top of it. At the program, we serve oatmeal. And we also serve brown sugar. Mary eats her oatmeal with brown sugar. I eat mine plain. <laughs> Mary looks pretty good. If you put a little simple sugar on your pancakes, you know, on your potatoes, on your other foods in the form of ketchup, in the form of a little brown sugar, white sugar, maple syrup, agave, whatever you want to call it, you will trick yourself into loving the food and you will eat it and you will solve food poisoning from the animals and the oils. We also use a little bit of salt, uh, a little salt. The tongue, remember, tastes with pleasure salt. Traditionally, we've been taught, don't eat salt. Salt's bad for you. Lately, however, the Cochrane Collaboration, the N. Haynes Study, the Journal of the American Medical Association, various big scientific research organizations have come out. I mean, as recently as six weeks ago, it was an editorial in the New York Times saying that too low salt may not be good for you. And it makes sense to me that too little salt may not be good for you. I know I've been traditionally taught to prescribe a low salt diet. I learned from Walter Kempner at Duke University who served his patients a diet of white rice, sugar, fruit, and fruit juice. That's all I served. Low salt was the key to the Kempner diet. I was raised in that kind of environment thinking that salt was really important to eliminate. But I've kind of rethought that. I don't know that it's so good for us to be on such a low salt diet. I think there's pretty good evidence to say that we should be taking a little salt. We have the taste buds for salt on the tip of their tongue. They're not a mistake. The New York Times uh, editorial of about six weeks ago, you'll find it in the Sunday editorial, says that we should be eating somewhere between three and six grams of salt a day. The diet we serve is about a half to one gram, and then we have people put about half a teaspoon of salt on the surface of the food. So our diet is about two grams, less than the three grams that's recommended by some people these days. It's a relatively salt diet, low salt diet, but it's salty enough so that you like the food. I want you to eat the food. If you put a little sugar, a little salt on the surface of the food, you get great pleasure with very little of these traditionally thought of as evil substances. And then you put your favorite spices on it. Spices can burn, they do. Some people don't like the idea of adding spice. I, I remember my Korean patients I used to take care of when I was a plantation doctor 35 years ago. They would come into me and they'd say, Doc, you know, this kimchi, I really love my kimchi, but Doc, when is the burning going to stop, Doc? <laughs> you know, spices burn. They do. But they also make the food very enjoyable. You can make a starch-based meal plan as tasty as any other meal plan out there. That's where the enjoyment, that's the only reason you can eat the meat, is because you put sugar and salt and spice on it in the form of barbecue sauce. A wants to, otherwise you couldn't eat it. You could take these same flavorings that allows you to eat something that's designed for my cat. You could put them over potatoes and sweet potatoes and corn and rice and so on and make a very tasty meal plan. Uh, vitamins, don't take vitamin supplements, they're toxic. Uh, taking these multi, even one a day multivitamin supplements. The Cochrane Collaboration says for every one million multivitamin supplement users, there are 9,000 extra deaths. The U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, the American Heart Association, every organization that I know of will tell you that supplements do not help you and will harm you. Why would you expect otherwise? These are isolated, concentrated nutrients. These are things that a manufacturer has taken out of a carrot or an apple or some other food, taken one ingredient, pulled it out, concentrated it thousands fold, and isolated it from all the other nutrients and then feed it back to you. What would you expect but nutritional imbalances? You increase your risk of cancer and heart disease and overall mortality by 20 to 30 percent. And that's what the research says on folic acid, beta carotene, vitamin E, et cetera. Don't take these things, they're dangerous. There is one supplement that we do recommend, it's vitamin B12. I have to tell you, I reserve the right to change my opinion on B12. 
So far for the last 35 years, we've told people to take a little bit if they're going to be on a pure vegan diet like we are a little bit, just to cover all bases. So a little B12 would be okay to take. You need a little exercise, you need a little sunshine. Be careful. I went to see my uh, hairdresser, cuts my hair about every three months in Santa Rosa. I went to see her a month ago. As we, you know, that's where I catch up on the gossip. And we're talking about her and her friends. She rides, she bike rides with 20 other women. And from the time I saw her the time before, three months earlier, one woman fell off, suffered a forearm fracture and a collarbone fracture. The other woman was still in the hospital recovering from a concussion after a month of falling off her bike. Exercise is dangerous, be careful. <laughs> on Thursday, on Thursday, I was exercising. I do this once in a while. I was out with my son, he's a kiteboarder, and I was out with my windsurfer in the Pacific Ocean. That's a dangerous sport. There are big fish out there. But I like doing it, and I'm willing to take the risks. My point being is you should walk around a little bit, get some exercise as long as you really enjoy it and you realize that there's some some adverse effects to exercise you can get hurt exercising take those risks into account and stop thinking that you're going to solve dietary diseases as food poisoning by running you're not going to do it so a little exercise a little sunshine somebody like myself i don't need much sunshine I, I'm a very light-skinned person. I get all the sun I need, maybe five, ten minutes, three times a week out in the sun at noon. Plenty, plenty for me. Darker-skinned people uh, who have moved away from the equator, you have dark skin, you need to spend more time in the sun. It's crucial to get enough sun, but not too much. Again, a caution sign here. And then one last thought, and that is, I'm, I'm kind of finished getting excited about helping people cure themselves of type 2 diabetes or getting out of heart surgery. I've done it with people thousands of times. It's fun. I know it's going to happen. It's not that much fun. I'm kind of on a new quest. And that new quest has come about because of my age. I am now a grandfather. I have six grandkids and one on the way. There are other reasons, as you've heard, and I want to emphasize, there are other reasons to change your diet, to stop food poisoning, just other reasons besides saving yourself and your spouse and your kids. The other reason to do it is to save the planet. This may be the reason that people finally change their diet. It's because of the environmental destruction that's done. You've heard that over half the greenhouse gases are produced by the livestock industry. So when you cure food poisoning in terms of your own constipation and indigestion, you also cure poisoning of the planet. If something is right, it must be right from all points of view, I think. In other words, it should be the message taught in your religious textbooks. It should be the message that teaches you how to lose weight, how to make your bowels work better. It should be a message that's kind to animals. It should be a message that's kind to the planet. It ought to come up positive from every point of view if it's really true. From every point of view, eating a starch-based diet is true. I don't think there's one thing you can tell me negative about taking that position that you can regain your health by stopping food poisoning, which is animal foods and oils, and instead getting your calories from starches, vegetables, and fruits. That's what I wanted to tell you today. That's all I can think about anymore. I walk out in the lobby, I see these people walk by, and Mary will tell you, what do I say? Food poisoning, food poisoning. It's food poisoning, just look, once you see it, everybody you see is suffering, and you wanna go up to them, and you wanna shake them, and you wanna say, you know, this is as serious as lead poisoning, or arsenic poisoning, or salmonella, you can fix this, just stop the food poisons. I hope it's clear to you, and I hope you can carry this message forward to friends and relatives and look at it that clear and tell them, no, it's not 70%, it's not 90%. You must stop at 100%, and the results are always what you're looking for. Thank you very much. All right.